So let's begin with your current coordinates. You, uh, you're not obviously in Toronto and Canada anymore. Last I heard that you, you were someplace between Ireland and Australia. Where are you at the moment? I made it to Australia. Yeah, is swam it, all the way. So is, is this a full immigration? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, officially about a year and a half ago, um, I became a, an official resident of Australia. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, you know, the, the reason for that move uh, from Ireland was that um, my young son, Django, um, uh, he was about to turn four years old. And it's around the time that, you know, um, a child of that age will go into, like, you know, pre-kindy, something like that. And, uh, you know, his father, being the gypsy that he is, um, you know, we felt uh, as his parents that uh, it was uh, the time for him to be surrounded by, you know, a, a network of supports, you know, and um, so Django's grandmother and his aunties and his uncles and his cousins, they all live in Perth, Australia. So, um, you know, we decided to move there. Fabulous wine country. Mm -hmm. Margaret River. Yes. Um, but the Tea Party was also rather big in Australia, so you must have had the affinity that, that grew out of that, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, for all intents and purposes, as far as, you know, you look back on, um, you know, the 90s and when we started off, you know, with the, with the bands and, and in Australia, we were pretty much the first Canadian band of that era, you know, to have major success, you know, open the doors for a lot of other bands to come through, you know. Yeah, I remember that. And, um, and it's just been the love affair that's continued on, even after the band's, um, you know, um, demise or break. And uh, um, so, yeah, it's just been... Um, it's been a wonderful thing, you know, like I'm very, very supportive and, um, and I, I really am uh, very fond of the um, Australian music scene as well. You know, it's very vibrant. Well, that's a tough scene because we've heard for years, decades really, about the, uh, you know, you have to, the, the, the pub circuit that you've got to play. Yep. And those people in those venues will tell you the truth immediately. Exactly. You either suck or you're great. You don't know how many, and I love it. See, that's what I love about the Australian audience because especially, you know, a lot of the English bands. You know, God bless them, right? But, you know, they're all like, you know, we're the greatest band in the fucking world, you know, and all this stuff, right? You know, And they go to Australia, and they're sent home with a tail between their legs. You know what I mean? And it's just like, yeah, baby. <laughs> That's how you do it. Well, we talked, to, we talked a lot with the guys from Airborne, <clears throat> mm -hmm. you know, and how they grew up on that circuit. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're tough, man. Oh, yeah. They're very, very oh, you tough. Know, and you know what? It's great for bands, though, because it's... Uh, not only um, does it, you know, it proves your metal to a certain extent, right? But it, it will make you a better band, you know, playing that type of circuit. I mean, the Tea Party became a better band for the amount of times that we kept on going back to Australia, you know, because we toured so hard and extensively. And it wasn't just, you know, the capital cities in Australia. It was like, you know, going uh, to the B markets and the rural areas and all that stuff. Right? Yeah, up to Darwin and out west to, yes, I guess, right. Perth. And yes, come to Australia. The women are beautiful and the animals will kill you. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just about everything on the ground will kill you there. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So I'm going to wait till it dries out in Queensland a little bit, and then yes, uh, yeah. head that way. Um, <clears throat> now, this new project is Jeff Martin Seven Seven Seven. I thought it had something to do with airplanes, given how much time you spend on jets. Mm -hmm. But you've corrected me, and you're telling me it's all about Alistair Crowley. It has a lot to do with Crowley. Yes, uh, that that number has uh, you know played a big part. Um, in my psychological makeup for quite some time now. But for those of you that don't know, uh, with Crowley's work, uh, he was the author of a book called uh, 777. And um, it's basically, a, it's a manual on all things, you know, Kabbalistic. You know, it's, it's like, a, it's a filing cabinet for all things esoteric, mm -hmm. you know. And um, for my purposes, spiritually in my life, um, that book is almost, um, it's become like a manual for me. So that symbol, the triple seven, has uh, you know become basically a symbol for the three personalities that now exist in this new band. Okay, so this is beyond what we've heard about Alistair from Jimmy Page and Ozzy yeah, Osbourne you know, because that. yeah, there's there's misconceptions, you know, because I mean, you know, most people when they think of Crowley, you know, because of uh, Mr. Osborne's, you know, Mr. Crowley, and you know, and then the misconceptions of the, you know the darker side of Page and all that stuff. I mean, it's <clears throat> if you really get into um, the finer aspects of Crowley's work. Um, it's it's um, it's a lifelong achievement that um, is about balance. You know, I mean, everyone loses their way at one point or another in life. Right? Crowley certain, certainly did as well. But uh, I kind of steer away from that aspect of it, and I'm trying to like focus on the balance. You know, mm. and um, I'm still working on that. So, so how do we pronounce the name of the band correctly? I guess Jeff Martin Triple Seven. Jeff Martin. Okay. Now, uh, <coughs> listening to this record. First of all, where was it recorded? Because the, the drums are huge. The guitars are huge. 
In fact, the whole thing sounds gigantic. It's huge. How does it fit into that little thing? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I was even listening to an MP3 stream. Yeah, yeah right. And it was gigantic. Do you know what, Sam? I, uh, one of the best compliments I've ever received, you know, like George Marino mm. uh, mastered this record, right? And, um, you know, as you know, I'm a big Led Zeppelin fan. Yeah. Massive. And uh, one of my favorite things as far as an audiophile is concerned was listening to the remasters of Led Zeppelin that George did. Right? And um, for George to say that this is the closest thing, if not the thing, you know, that sounds like Led Zeppelin, I was just like, whoa. Well, I can't argue with him because, you know, those are, those are Bonzo-style drums mm -hmm. in terms of their hugeness. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's something else, I don't know, about the, the depth of the field or the width of the, the sound field. I don't know, but it, it, it really does fill a room. <laughs> In, in, a, in a very, very big way. And your vocals are up, for, up front with that... Um, Finally. Finally yeah, got that right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah, you're not fighting with the arrangement, but at the same time, mm. it, you know, you're not overwhelming the arrangement. Mm. It, it's, 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 it's a, sonically, it's a terrific record. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. So the, the record starts with the first single, with... Uh, the Ground Cries Out. The yeah. Ground Cries Out. Mm. Um, do you want to go through the songs? Uh, yeah, the album songs? Okay, let's do that. So Ground Cries Out. Track, track one of 12. I've heard 10 of them. So you'll talk, tell me about the other two when we get to them. Okay, cool. Ground so, cries out. Uh, ground cries out. Well, let's think about the events that are going on in the world right now, right? Well, um, I, I've always found it kind of strange. Uh, there's been a few moments in my career where I've written a song, and something happens in my world, <coughs> in our world, whatever, right? And there's a synchronicity that occurs, okay? So the ground cri cries out was uh, inspired by a poem by the Sufi poet Rumi. Okay, of that name, the ground cries out, and and basically it's about you know chthonic you know powers like you know coming from the earth you know finding you know your inspiration finding your voice you know and pushing through you know within without, and uh, then you know you look at like a month ago what happened in Egypt you know so in, in 1999 I was in Egypt I wrote that little melody <coughs> on a very cheesy little Egyptian keyboard you know da da da. -da, -da. And I put it on a little cassette tape. Forgot about it totally. Never used it with the tea party. Found it again. Wrote a whole song around it. Right, the ground cries out. You know, it's this swelling. This is like this mass movement. Mm -hmm. You know, and then these things are happening in Egypt. You know, with uh, you know the people rising up and everything else. And I'm thinking to myself, for a rock song, that's pretty relevant. <laughs> and I didn't even like, you know, mean it. You know? Let's uh, let's talk about the, the the Arabic and Middle Eastern influences. Uh, this is, goes back. You know, decades in your music. Why the affinity towards that part of the world? Um, I, I wish I could answer. You know, like um, it's it's making me um, it's making me believe a little bit um, more succinctly, like a bit more strongly in um, the theory of transmigration of souls. Okay, and I'll tell you why. There is no reason whatsoever why an eleven-year-old kid from Windsor, Ontario, right? Could listen to something like um, you know George Harrison, like Within You, Without You, from Sgt. Pepper's, 11 years old, and go, I get it, and I remember everything. Mm. Right? It was just like it was like the world came back to me, and it was just I had to find it all again. You know, so there's something going on, you know, beyond the veil. I do believe, you know, because uh, um, you know I'm not I'm not trained. Um, Classically, in those modes of music. No, because you know? there's different scales, there's, there's different tones, yeah. there's different rhythms. But somehow, some way, um, I can decipher between Turkish, Egyptian, you know, um, um, uh, Moroccan, right? Mm -hmm. And I know those scales. I know those rhythms, you know. And it's very, it's uh, it's innate. It's innate. Yeah. Wow. It's a little off-putting sometimes too, you know. Okay. So. Second song is Queen of Spades, which has this. Um, Swampy sort of trampled underfoot feel. Yeah, man. Yeah, that would be Jay Cortez, the new bass player. Right? That would be his influence in the band. How, how many people in the band? Three. Okay. It might remind you of an old band I used to play in. Um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, Jay Cortez. You know, he's this cool cat, um, incredible musician. Looks exactly like Robert Plant. Right? Tall guy, quite a charmer. Right? And but he lives in this music bubble, right? Of like you know Graham Parsons, Exile on Main Street. You know. That's the time frame, 71 to 74, <laughs> nothing else, right? You know, and, and, and he loves that, you know, that country rock stuff and everything, right? And so that was, like, you know, that was his influence. And, you know, um, and he never really liked the Tea Party. Uh-oh. 
yeah, it wasn't his cup of tea, you know, so yeah, I had to use it. But, um, you know, but what he did like, the only songs he did like was when the Tea Party sort of like, you know, tackled the blues or whatever, right? And so that's what he wanted to bring in on this record, and I was like, yeah, you know what? Feels good. Time. Let's do it. Okay, we're going to come back to the blues a little bit later on, mm. but let's, let's talk about She's Leaving. Mm. Track three. Yeah, well, you know, um, uh, the life um, that I've led... Um, I have loved and um, I have lost. And, you know, without going into a great amount of detail, I don't think that that song could be more... Uh, uh, I don't think I could expose myself more in a song, you know? So, um, you know... So I, I listened to it and I didn't want to ask any specific questions about it because I had that feeling that there was something pretty personal about it. Yeah, you know, but, um, you know, things move on. And... Uh, you hope for the best. Then we get to the Cobra, which is uh, Arabic overtones, undertones. Mm. Uh, very big, very majestic with a string arrangement, mm. right? Mm. Cool thing about those strings. Remember I was talking about uh, that cheesy keyboard in Egypt yeah. from the ground cries out? Well, what it is, it's called a gem, okay? So the keyboard looks like a normal keyboard, like a normal piano, you know, like your, your white and black keys. Mm -hmm. But the way it's tuned, it has the quarter tones in it, you know what Ooh, I mean? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's it's screwed up, right? And those that's those strings in that song, right? Because you know I'm doing da 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 na 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 na. Yeah, because it, yeah. it's almost like they bend. Yeah. And that's the vibe, you know. So that's like the real deal, like the real Arabic keys, you know, and all that, right? Okay. So hard to play because you got to like you know to turn your head around when you're like. Is that a sharp or a flat? Well, neither. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah. Um, the next song is uh, 1916. Mm-hmm. What's 1960? What's the significance? Uh, you know, that, that was the, uh, it's the year of my harp guitar. You know, that Gibson harp guitar that I have. Right. right? And uh, I was listening to this uh, guitar player, Stephen Bennett, uh, who's a harp guitarist as well. And, uh, you know, and um, uh, he had a really cool song called Perestroika that, um, you know, I just loved. And, you know, I'm a bit of a magpie, you know, um, so I take after Paige. Right? And, uh, you know, and I just, uh, you know, I kind of borrowed. Um, you know, a lot uh, from that song, but you know, it's changed it around. And uh, but playing on the harp guitar and using the harp and you know the six string and all that, and you know, it was just this musical piece that uh, the band composed and everything. You know, and uh, so we had to give it a working title. You know, 1916 was just a working title, but it was just one of those things that, even though I started to write the lyrics and everything, we still liked that title, so we just kind of kept it. You know? All right, how about my Mekong? This is one song I haven't heard yet. The Mekong, yes. Right. Now, are we talking about? The river in Southeast Asia? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're talking about Jay Cortez uh, again. Um, Jay loves to go to that part of the world. Um, there's an attraction for him. Um, I've never personally been, right? but he loves like Vietnam and Laos and places like that. And, uh, you know, loves taking those old junks, you know, down those rivers. I've actually done that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I did a whole uh, Martin Sheen Apocalypse Now trip once. The opium thing? Uh, except for the opium thing. Okay. Jay did the opium thing. I think I did. Oh, he did? <laughs> yes, he did. I cut a head off a cow, but I didn't do the opium thing. You cut a head no, off? No, I didn't. I was just kidding. Oh. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <coughs> but, um, yeah, no. So I, did, I did go to a, a rifle range, though. Does this have anything to do with a cow? Uh, no, it doesn't. But the guy at the rifle range says, you had so much fun shooting this AK-47. Would you come up with me to the Cambodian border, and I'll let you shoot a rocket launcher? I go, really? And he goes, yeah. And you can shoot it at a cow. So it does have something to do with the cow. Well, I guess it does. And he says, uh, I said, how much? He goes, $2,500, including the cow. What, do you, what do you do with the cow? <laughs> I don't know. It's, just, it's a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So anyway, back to the river and your, uh, your bass player. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, no cows, but uh, there were, I think there was some opium involved. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and the, this little spike fiddle <clears throat> is called a tro. Uh, Where's that from? I believe, well, his, like, there's, there's different ones. There's ones from Cambodia, ones from Vietnam. Okay, right? but, but it's a Southeast Asian. Yes, okay. yes, yeah. And I think it, it's like, a, it's two strings. And what's weird about this uh, little spike fiddle is that the bow is actually permanently attached in between the two strings. Right. You know, I know, what, you, yeah, I know yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, so, so, you know, Jay being Jay, he's going down the Mekong, smoking opium, playing this tro, and he comes up with this melody, <laughs> right, on his little recorder, right, and he comes back, you know, and he's like, Martin, you know, listen to this. What do you think of this? And I'm like, that's Fucking brilliant, man. That is brilliant. Perfect way, like, you know, to just, like, you know, break up the records. You know, and it's another, 
it's another taste of the world that you know we haven't you know put on anything yet. You know, so right. very cool. Okay, the next song is uh, one star in sight. We're seven songs in, and we finally get to a major key. <laughs> Do we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, what? Queen of Spades? No. Okay, I guess it's not. No. Okay, you're right. Okay, fine, you're right. So you, you get it takes seven songs to get happy. Or oh come on. Okay, not happy. All right, it takes seven songs to get into a major key. Okay, fine. I'll go with that. Um, but yeah, it's no one star in sight. You know, um, <clears throat> sorry, back to Crowley. Um, but uh, uh, when Crowley was a young man, uh, he wrote um, a poem with the title "One Star in Sight." You know, um, I just fell in love with that title because uh, it meant something different to me. Um, the, the poetry that Crowley associated with that title really didn't <coughs> it didn't um, move me. But what did move me was, uh, you know, thinking about, um, you know, the priority, priorities in life and how they change. Mm. And for me, you know, it's basically um, everything I'm doing now, uh, yes, it's for my artistry, but it's, like, directed towards my son, you know, and uh, for his benefit and his welfare and, you know, whatever my legacy is going to be for him, you know, one star in sight, him. Blue Mountain Sun, again, another song I haven't heard yet. Okay. Blue Mountain Sun is an instrumental. And uh, um, an hour and a half north of Sydney, in New South Wales, is the Blue Mountains, a beautiful region of uh, Australia. And um, <clears throat> there's a little gig up there in a little village called Katoomba, a little heritage village. And um, that's, uh, you know, we'll play maybe like once a year, a little acoustic gig. And uh, so myself <coughs> and Kenny, uh, my guitar tech, and, and Jay, we were in the van driving up, you know, uh, into the Blue Mountains. Beautiful sunny day. And I'm in the passenger seat, and of course I'm in charge of the iPod. I don't let anyone else be in charge of it. Right? And uh, you know, so I'm just scrolling through, and we're listening to like you know, um, Deja Vu, Crosby, Stills and Nash, you know, some uh, some of uh, Neil Young's like Harvest and all that, and and then um, some of the, the the acoustic stuff of Zeppelin, like you know, Page did, and uh, that one song Brawny R, you know, came on off of Physical Graffiti. And I remember looking to Kenny, you know, Blue Mountains, you know, it's this beautiful scenery, the sun is shining, right, and the song is playing, and I remember looking at Kenny and going, I can do this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And Kenny's like, go ahead, right? And, um, and I just started, like, this melody came into my head, and by the time we got um, to the venue, um, I'd pretty much written this little beautiful... Um, on what? An instrumental piece on an acoustic, but it was in my head first. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I just let it out when I got to the hotel. Santeria, are we talking voodoo? Yep. From where? Are we talking Haitian voodoo? Yeah, well, no, I think more Cuban, you know, okay. because um, uh, remember that uh, song, um, Walking Wounded, uh, the yes. Tea Party? And uh, we, we went down to Cuba to shoot that. And the whole premise behind the video and the storyline had to do with Santeria, you know, and, uh, you know, the messenger and all of that, you know, with the guy on the bike and everything. And Santeria is basically, uh, you know, it's the, it is a name, um, a proper name for an, a tangent of voodoo. Right? right, it's mixed with the uh, Catholicism, Catholicism yes. and the Christian saints. Right, yeah. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things that, so when Malcolm Clark, who's the new drummer, um, he started, you know, playing this rhythm for this song, and we started jamming the song, you know, it's just like, it's all jungle to me, you know, it's just like primal, you know, and it was, had this pulse. And um, I think perhaps like maybe a month before, I was reading once again about that subject, you know, and... Uh, so the title just came up, and it was like, okay. And then, uh, you know, for the chorus of that song, Santeria, you know, it goes, uh, lave tate, you know, so it's all in patois, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, lave tate, you know, wash your head, potomiton, little virgin, hey, la hey, <laughs> you know, potomiton, <laughs> it's uh, becoming a dirty old man. <laughs> uh, track 11 is Riverboat Rambler. Riverland Rambler. Riverland Rambler, yeah. sorry. Right, yes. Um, bought a Jaguar in what Perth. Kind? What kind? Uh, a Daimler, actually, a Daimler Sovereign, 1979 Daimler Sovereign. Oh, I thought you were going to get the. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Okay, classic man. It is a classic. Yeah. Jay and I, and Malcolm, um, and another friend, uh, were taking the car for a test drive because we we got a gig down in Margaret River, okay, in Perth, right? Again, beautiful sunny day. There's a certain cloud that's coming out of the Jaguar, you know, uh, an oil-filled, yes, noxious, yes, yes, something like that. That's a '79 Jag. Yep, and. Uh, and uh, there's, um, there's this um, sign at the side of the road uh, for this new um, housing estate, and it says the Riverland Ramble, right? And, uh, you know, I remember saying to the boys, that would make a cool title, you know, for a song, right? 
And then we uh, we sort of got on the subject. We know this cat in Perth, the guy's about 55 years old. Um, his name is Rob. Bald, big white beard. Looks like he's in, you know, Hell's Angels, right? But a sweetheart, sweetheart. And a uh, very, very wise man, you know? He's like a, kind of a... Yeah, it was like a, it was like a spiritual hobo or something like that, you know. And um, but the one thing we can't figure out with this guy, right? As much as we love him, he has the hottest wife you've ever seen. Score one for the ugly guy. Yeah, <laughs> oh, awesome. I love when that happens. <laughs> so you know, so it's like you know, I know the Riverland, you know, Rambler, right? Yeah. He's cool, man. He lives with a dancer, you know. And that's, this whole thing started coming up. Well, with this, this joke. This, you know? this is this is this is one of those bluesy, swampy sort of yeah, songs yeah. in the record. Yeah. Well, see, that's you know, this is what I'm, I'm digging about this record is because uh, there's fun on it. You know, I don't yeah. think that I've ever done fun. Ah, uh, you've been always rather serious. Yeah. Artist, yeah. But yeah, you know what? There are elements of fun on this record. Yeah. It sounds like you're having, you know, like, like jams, like, like yeah. proper, like we're in a, a, a juke joint kind of jam. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, we had a blast making this record, you know. And if, if there's one thing I want, you know, with this record is that the amount of joy that we got making it, you know, and the laughs and everything else, and just that that feeling, you know, that, that exuberance. That's all I want for people. I want them to be able to feel the same thing listening to it, get that experience. The record cl closes with the pyre, which is a uh, very ambient and atmospheric. Mm, yeah. Well, the pyre is a um, pretty heavy song uh, when it kicks in, yeah. um, and uh, the storyline is, uh, you know, I've always been fascinated about, uh, you know, the history of, uh, you know, the Salem uh, witch trials and the burning times and all that, and uh, and uh, so it's just basically it's like it, it kind of the pyre is almost like um, from the Armada records uh, that song Morocco. It's kind of the story is like Morocco Part Two. Okay. They actually got her now. Oh. Yeah. I noticed one thing about the record. Do all the songs fade up? There may be one or two that start immediately, but it, it occurred to me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, there's two that don't. The two that don't. Yeah. Okay. It's just interesting how, how they a song will end, and then another one fades up rather than hit you in the face. Mm. It's just, a, it, I, just a, an observation. Well, you know, I'm still pretending that, you know, we're listening to records, mate. You know, <laughs> so, you know, I'm still pretending that everyone's listening on headphones and they're drinking a glass of wine and, you know, they got to turn it over and all that stuff. Well, so. I, I tell you, if you're going to listen to something on headphones, I would listen to this record because, again, this production is awesome. The, the instrumentation is, is terrific. Coming from you, that means a lot. Thank well, you. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's, I had a good time listening to it. And awesome. I, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to get it on vinyl. Okay. So. I called Abbey Road. And? They can do it. Really? They're one of the few that can now. So what would they do? Oh, they'd press it. Yeah, they'd, they'd master it for vinyl. They'd master it for vinyl, okay. Because yeah. it would sound like 180 gram vinyl. It should sound good. Mm -hmm. good. All right, Jeff. Well, thank you for, it's been a while since we had a chance to talk. Good Pleasure. luck with the record. Thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this live. Cool. Yeah. I just remember that you guys were the loudest band, next to Anvil, you were the loudest <laughs> band. <laughs> What's with this Anvil thing? I keep <laughs> coming back, man. <laughs> Yeah. The loudest band I've ever sat in front of. Really? Yes. It's okay. I've got the ear protection. Right? March 23rd, the Mod Club. All right. Right? Cool ass. All right. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> Explore Music wears English Laundry Apparel.